Right, morning year nine. Um, this is your second video on Ozymandias. Just a quick um, video to help you to understand how form and structure has been used in the poem of Ozymandias. Um, so the first thing we're going to be looking at is the idea that Shelley used um, the structure of a sonnet um, for this particular poem. So if you have a look at um, the number of lines in this poem, you'll see that there are 14 lines and that's quite classically found within a sonnet. Um, sonnets were quite a popular um, form of poetry um, from when Shelley was writing, but also previously as well. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting about this poem is there are two types of, or the elements of two types of sonnet within this poem. Um, and we know this because we can look at just some of the, the features within there. So the first type of sonnet that we might talk about is something called a Petrarchan sonnet. So a Petrarchan sonnet, I suppose, is the oldest and, and original version um, of the sonnet form. Um, and generally, that is written um, using iambic pentameter. Iambic pentameter, hopefully you've studied this before, but iambic pentameter is just the number, it's, it's a meter that's used in poetry, which is to do with the number of um, syllables within a line and it gives it a particular rhythm. So I met a traveller from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone, sand in the desert, near them on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies whose frown. Now you wouldn't necessarily read it like that but you can hear that there are um, 10 syllables per line um, and it gives this this particular rhythm. So um, it kind of links to the idea of a Petrarchan sonnet, okay? Um, and I'll tell you why that's important in a minute. So we've got iambic pentameter, and we've also got two main sections within the poem. So typically sonnets were used to kind of explore elements of tension between two things. So you'd have the, um, the poem would be in two parts. You'd have the first part, would be um, where the, perhaps the problem um, is suggested. And then the second part would be where the problem perhaps is, is resolved in some way. Um, if you have a look at how this poem is divided up, you'll see that the first, um, the first section is the first eight lines. Um, so all the way down, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But all the way down to here, um, all the way down to this line here, ooh, a bit wobbly, is the first eight lines is different to what's happening in the second, in the second part of the poem. This whole first part of the poem is setting up um, the context in which he, the traveller, has found the statue. Um, and we're told about um, perhaps the character of the statue. Um, and perhaps the way he's been kind of um, captured over time. Um, but in the second part of the poem, and on the pedestal, these words are where appear, my name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. The Com so this bit here is more kind of um, showing us the pointless um, and ironic declaration that he makes here. Um, so you've kind of got those two parts. Now, the fact that it's got eight lines and six lines in, in the way it's divided, that belongs to the Petrarchan um, sonnet form. So that is relevant, um, and it will become clear why in a minute. Um, so the second type of sonnet that we see as a reference um, within this poem is the Shakespearean sonnet as well. Um, and that is because at the beginning, we can see this rhyme scheme that we would describe as an A, B, A, B rhyme scheme. It doesn't stick to it all the way through. But in the first couple of lines, we see that rhyme scheme. Um, so you can see that land and sand and stone and frown um, 
rhyme. And so that is taken from a Shakespearean sonnet rhyme scheme. So a Shakespearean sonnet is slightly different to a Petrarchan sonnet in the way that it's put together. Um, and one of those things is the rhyme scheme. A Petrarchan sonnet would not have a rhyme scheme like this. Um, so there we have two elements of two different sonnets. And the third thing we see is the way that Shelley chooses to end his sonnet. Normally, if you were looking at a Shakespearean sonnet, you would have the last two lines, the last two words would be a rhyming couplet. Um, and that doesn't exist here either. So what you've got is Shelley playing around with form. Shelley is experimenting with form and deliberately borrowing from two different um, types of sonnet, but also kind of throwing his own um, version into the mix as well. So when we're trying to understand, well, okay, what does that mean in terms of me understanding the poem? Or how does that link to themes or ideas? Well, don't forget that this poem is about the idea that um, power doesn't last forever, that actually the nature of power um, is ever changing. You cannot have one version, one person ruling forever um, because, um, you know, men are mortal and women. So you've got the idea that perhaps Shelley is reflecting that if he uses a form that's borrowed from different elements um, of, of a, a classic form of poetry and then changed it himself, that could be an example of Shelley using the form to represent um, power itself and how it changes through time. Um, and therefore, the, he has used um, elements of, of uh, this classic form of poetry. It has changed. It's changed through time. Um, so you've got this kind of ever transient, ever moving um, element of expression, just like um, the idea of power and how power, um, things need to keep moving on. Um, things need to change. You can't have one person, one version of something um, forevermore. So there's that idea. But I think there's also the idea that actually it's important for us to look to examples um, from history. So, you know, the whole idea that this traveller is from an antique land, is come from somewhere far away, a lesson from history, a lesson from time. Um, and perhaps looking at giving us an example of how not to rule or how not to um, try to, you know, enforce what you think is important as a ruler um, onto people. Um, and here perhaps Shelley is, you know, borrowing from different forms or different forms of the sonnet to show that we need to be flexible, that we need to look and, and look at different examples um, and utilize different methods um, in order to be successful. So he could be kind of sort of being quite modern in the way that he's using these two um, quite classic forms of poetry, or you could flip it on its head and say, actually, he's taking these archaic, um, <clears throat> this archaic form of the sonnet and modernizing it, he's changing it and making it um, more effective, um, more dynamic. Um, there's that idea as well. So that's something for you to note, I would say, about the form um, of Ozymandias. It's this idea that it's neither one thing or the other, but it borrows from two different types of sonnet um, and also kind of introduces his own version as well. Um, other things that you want to think about when you're thinking about structure um, 
if we go back to the um, annotated version of the poem, um, I've highlighted some things in orange that are structural features. So the first thing I would say is this idea here, the fact that this poem is a, a framed narrative. There's a framed narrative within the poem. That means that at the beginning of the poem, we um, hear the voice of the traveller um, who tells us the rest of the poem. So the first line, you've got the, po um, the, the poetic voice. At the beginning, I met a traveller from an antique land who said, but then you've got this kind of pause and then um, the rest of the poem is from the perspective um, of the traveller. So you might want to think about why it is that Shelley decides to use somebody else's voice, um, a, a, a second voice within the poem, at, and why he uses just that introduction at the beginning, I met a traveller from an antique land. Um, that would be to do with structure because we would be looking at kind of how the poem starts. And when we're thinking about structure, we do quite often want to look at the beginning of the poem and what's happening at the beginning there. Um, and I suppose it's the idea that Shelley is introducing um, somebody else's wisdom, um, a story that's being told, which ha you know, has, as I said before, a lesson to be learned from it. Um, takes us, it transports us right into uh, the desert there with, you know, sort of almost casts us back into history. Um, so that's a structural idea. The fact that, um, I've talked about it already, but you've got the, the S sound, the whispering sound that is um, littered through the poem. It's, um, and that's a structural thing. If, if something is kind of uh, repeated or used throughout the poem, this technique is woven through the poem um, and it enhance the, enhances the desolate feel like the wind whistling um, or a voice from the past. Um, so we did talk about that from a language perspective, but it's also um, structural as well. It carries on all the way through. So you've got this one here, which survives, stamped on his lifeless things. Um, nothing beside remains, lone and level sands stretch far away. So that sound is repeated all the way through that structural because um it's woven through um the poem um also things like this line here tell that it's sculpture well those passions read this is a really interesting line and the poem as i said to you is written in iambic pentameter um but this line here um it's slightly slowed down and it's, it's because of the way that that particular sentence, the order is written, tells that it's sculpture well those passions read. It's um, at that point in the poem, it slows um, that line down because of, the, because of the order of the words. Um, well those passions read, so the, the, the syntax, the way it's put together, it is, is quite interesting in it slows the line down it's very considered um, and it's inviting us to stop and think about um, this particular character of Ozymandias um, and then of course if we're talking structurally as well once we get to the, um, the sestet we were talking about this the uh, six lines um, we've also got here another voice, um, so a voice coming in um, at, towards the, the sort of the, the midpoint of the poem. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Um, so he's kind of placed that in, in quite an important, structurally in quite an important part of the poem. Um, that, what, that line there is almost used like a volta and a volta is like a, a turning point 
um, we hear this voice coming from the past. And then the juxtaposition of this line here, nothing besides remains. Um, following the declaration that he is the king of kings and that people should despair, um, undermines his authority and emphasizes that his voice is now silent. So that's a structural thing. The fact that Shelley has deliberately placed the voice of Ozymandias here as a Walter, as a turning point. And then the juxtaposition of this, nothing besides remains. Just to show us the irony um, of the fact that actually he was not king of kings and he did not have ultimate power. Um, and then, of course, the final bit, the end of the poem, the lone and level sands stretch far away. The fact that the end of the poem finishes on that image of the sands stretching far away um, reflects the kind of eternal quality of, of nature. So this poem ends, the, the lesson of this character comes to an end, just like his rule came to an end. But the lone and level sands stretch far away. They, they continue beyond um, the poem. And there is some discussion to be had about Shelley's view of art and how important art was in um, representing life um, and things to be learned from. And Shelley would have valued art. And when I'm talking about art, I mean poetry or painting or theatre, um, but literature probably above everything else. Shelley thought that, that was really important, um, an important way of understanding what it is to be human and to express ourselves. Shelley would have thought that um, a, a piece of art, such as a poem, showing us this kind of flawed nature of power <clears throat> is more eternal than the power itself, than the structure of power itself. So Shelley is somehow giving a message to the powers that be, potentially the ruling powers in England at that time, that, you know, when all is said and done, they will not be there forever. However, we will have these um, um, sort of um, evidence and examples and representations of life through artistic forms like his poetry and like the statue. And it's not Ozymandias that's in control of how he's remembered. It actually is the sculptor. Um, who read his passions, well, those passions read. And I think that's why in that line there, he gives him such an, ooh, such an important line here within the poem. He makes us stop and think about it. So I think those are the things that are really important when it comes to structure for Ozymandias. Um, this really is an exercise on you listening very carefully and making notes. I will put some um, links in your worksheet so that you can go away and look at just what a Petrarchan or a Shakespearean sonnet is. Um, but I've done it in two different parts so that you had the language in the first video and then form and structure in the second. But ultimately, as you can see, if you're looking at this sheet, which might look a bit confusing if you haven't been taken through it, they all interplay with each other. So language, form and structure are fluid. Um, it's quite difficult to separate them at times because one will complement the other or you could have an element that is both things. An element of structure might also come under a language feature as well. Okay. Thank you.